So, welcome back to another installment of my Deconstruction of White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. Now, uh, I have a lot of videos that I want to do right now, but I realize that this, if I don't bite down and finish this, I'm not going to get it done because the book is so toxic and so repulsive that I'm just putting it off and putting it off and putting it off and not wanting to deal with it. So, I'm going to bite the bullet and get it done. Um, I will begin, as always, by saying, first of all, that this um, is in no way, shape, or form cons uh, meant to be a promotion of any kind of uh, actual racist attitudes or white supremacy of any sort. You will not hear me say anything that denigrates black people or exalts white people. This is a deconstruction and response to the ideas put forth by Robin D'Angelo. Solving the problem of racism is a worthy a worthwhile and good endeavor. I simply believe that Robin D'Angelo has the wrong answers. Uh, also, any and all copyrighted materials are here presented for the purpose of commentary and criticism on matters of public interest and are therefore covered by the for use by the uh, fair use doctrine. All right, let's do this. So, first and foremost, I wanted to throw something interesting out there. Uh, I will not identify this person because it's just a personal friend, but I, as it turns out, uh, as I've been talking about this, these ideas privately, uh, I have a personal friend who has been to a Robin D'Angelo uh, diversity seminar, diversity training seminar, and she said that you know her whole office went. Uh, nobody complained. Nobody got angry. Nobody cried. Nobody yelled. Nobody stormed out. They all just sat there quietly, listened to what she had to say, and got up and left. So uh, that occurred to me that there might be this, there, there might be a certain, you know, the, the question that comes to my mind, rather, is of all of these experiences that Robin D'Angelo is talking about from her own personal experience, as, uh, assuming they all factually occurred, which I'm not suggesting they didn't, I'm saying assuming that's uh, correct, what percentage, I wonder what percentage of her diversity lectures actually resulted in these catastrophic events that she's describing where people are, uh, you know, slamming books down and getting up and yelling at her and storming out of the room and crying and arguing with each other and, you know, verbally fighting with each other and having panic attacks and anxiety meltdowns and all of this stuff. I wonder how much of that actually occurred. Because the thing is, if it were, uh, if it were a constant thing, if it was just total and complete, uh, pandemonium everywhere she goes, she wouldn't be able to get hired at all, most likely. So, then something else occurred to me. <clears throat> um, I noticed that Robin D'Angelo is 63. Now, in her book, she says that the events that prompted her to uh, cobble up the idea of white fragility, quote-unquote, occurred at diversity seminars she was a part of right out of college, right after she finished college. Now, if she's 63 years old, that means that right out of college was probably around 40 years ago. And that's worth considering because uh, several generations have grown up in that time. Uh, the world has made tremendous steps forward in terms of race relations. Things have gotten demonstrably better. That's, you know, I'm 30, I'll be 37 in September, so that's basically the window of my lifetime. Things have gotten better. I've lived through things getting better, um, all the way up to and including electing the first black president. So that's something I think is very, very worth considering. Think about the attitudes. I mean, you're talking early 1980s, you're getting, you're coming, you're coming out of the Mad Men generation into the me generation, what, what will become the Reagan decade and everything, it is a more arrogant time. It is a more machismo time. It is a more, uh, a far less politically correct time, for better or for worse. So it seems like, yeah, 40 years ago, she probably did encounter things like this. And that's worthy of consideration. It's one of those things where uh, I was just watching a thing on YouTube about 1984, and they talk about, well, I, I'm not saying that Robin D'Angelo is doing this intentionally. I think it's an unintended consequence of what she's doing. In 1984, the book, they talked about uh, one of the things is that the party is trying to erase time. 
They're trying to erase time and create a constant now. Because if you have no sense of past or future, if you're just in the present moment, you're much easier to control. And it occurred to me that that is very much what's going on with, you know, there's no time stamps in white fragility for what she's at, what, when these things happened. We don't know if this happened in, you know, if she's describing something that happened, the, the meltdowns and the, the uh, fighting at other seminars and everything. We don't know if that's something that happened in uh, the early 1980s or in, uh, you know, the uh, late 2000, you know, the late uh, part of the first decade of the 2000s, I believe it was 2011 the book was published. So like, you know, 2009, it could have happened in 2009, it could have happened in 1982. We don't know. And that's really interesting and really important because there's really, I, I don't think anything, or there's no time stamps given uh, for when certain things were happening. And it doesn't, I, I don't think there's really a lot of uh, reference points in terms of events like I could be wrong, but you know, I don't think there's a lot of things like, well, this happened right after this event, you know, the the O.J. Simpson verdict, or or the Rodney King beating, or something like that, and then this happened. There's n there's not a lot of reference points like that. So we know, I, I think we're given kind of a slip in terms of what's happened here because we're led to think that everything she's, I think we're allowed to think that everything she's describing happened ten minutes ago. You know, it happened like a year before the book was published or something. And uh, really, she could very, that's, that's like one of the very few timestamps she gives. So she really could be describing events from about 40 years ago uh, and trying to act like it's cur they're current. You know, to put that in perspective, um, it, would be, um, uh, it would be wholly irresponsible to present medical information about the AIDS virus or the HIV AIDS. Uh, virus from the early 1980s, back when they didn't even know it was a an STD, and they, you know, one of the leading theories was that it was uh, the result of um, uh, speed usage. Um, you know, present information from back then as if it is current knowledge. You know, when we've had 40 plus years of uh, evolution in terms of medical science and medical understanding of HIV/AIDS and how to treat it and how to control it and everything. That, you know, you, you think about how far, how much things have changed from then to now in terms of that virus, and think about, you could think about uh, race relations being similarly a, so, a problem for society that has evolved over 40 years. That's the level of difference that we're talking about here. So that's something very important to consider. Now, let's jump back into the book. People and a key aspect of challenging these messages is to identify their differences and how they shape my attitudes toward various groups of color. Further, there are myriad groups within these categories, and I have different attitudes here too. For example, my stereotypes about Japanese people are not the same as my stereotypes about Chinese people, and these stereotypes inform different responses. In this chapter, I will address the uniquely anti-black sentiment integral to white identity. So, here again we see the problem it's not just that she wants you to check attitudes that you may have that are problematic. She wants you to admit to having those attitudes even if you don't have them. So, for example, if she presents stereotype A about black people and I say, I don't believe that stereotype to be true, then that is not you giving the right answer, that is you denying your racism. So in order, the, the first thing you have to do as a white person is admit to a, a total unilateral concept of white racism that encapsulates stereotypes you may not even agree with. That is patently absurd. It is in no way, shape, or form productive to have people copying to believing stereotypes that they don't actually agree with. In doing so, I do not wish to minimize the racism that other groups of color experience. However, I believe that in the white mind, black people are the ultimate racial other, and we must grapple with this relationship. No, Robin, we are not in any way, shape, or form required to grapple with things that exist entirely in your head. 
that literally by her own admission here, this is solely her opinion. And that which can be asserted without evidence can also be dismissed without evidence. For my own personal experience, uh, black people probably constitute the least other of all of the racial others that are out there because I live in Atlanta. I'm surrounded by them constantly. It, it feel they feel it feels very familiar and and commonplace to me to be surrounded by blacks. So no, they don't constitute an extreme difference or an extreme other to me at all. Maybe to you who, because as we have, as I and Carlin Borisenko and I think um, Eric, Weins, uh, Eric Weinstein, I mean Brett Weinstein commented on this recently and more and more people that are looking into this book are coming to the conclusion, Robin, you are racist. You have a problem with black people. And the fact that you feel a little squirrely around black people is not a problem that the rest of us have to deal with. All right? For it is a foundational aspect of the racial socialization underlying white fragility. I remind my readers that I am addressing white people at the societal level. I have friends who are black and whom I love deeply. As another YouTube commentator put it, I promise you that Robin D'Angelo does not have one black friend that is not also a diversity coordinator. I do not have to suppress feelings of hatred and contempt as I sit with them, I see their humanity. But on the macro level, I also recognize the deep anti-black feelings that have been inculcated in me since childhood. These feelings surface immediately, in fact, before I can even think, when I conceptualize black people in general. The sentiments arise when I pass black strangers on the street, see stereotypical depictions of black people in the media, and hear the thinly veiled warnings and jokes passed between white okay, people. let's set aside the fact that it's becoming increasingly obvious that this is just uh, a bunch of uh, crap that she's projecting onto the rest of us because she herself is insecure around black people. And look at what she actually said there. So she has these automatic responses that enter, there are these automatic thoughts that enter her head as soon as she sees black people. Okay, so what? Does your brain stop working? Are you not capable of continuing to think? And this is what happens is, I think a lot of people on the far left, the social justice contingent of the left, are afraid of their, become afraid of their own shadows when really this is just how the brain works. Think about it this way. I used to do a lot of advocacy work, as people know, for sex workers' rights and for free speech rights as it relates to the adult film industry and things like that. And uh, I would get these messages from men where they, you know, very consistently would say this, uh, and it's something that is held up by anti-pornography activists and everything as being one of the, the warning signs that you're addicted to porn or sex addicted and all that. They would come to me and they would say, I knew I would, or they would say they knew they were addicted to porn when uh, they would, they realized that uh, as soon as they looked at a woman, the first thing they would think about is whether or not they wanted to have sex with her. To which my response would be, okay, well, what was the second thing you thought about her? What was the third thing you thought about her? Did your brain just stop working at the amygdala level? at the automatic primal response of whether or not you wanted to have sex with her, that is not, that's not indicative of porn addiction. That's indicative of you being a heterosexual male that is biologically wired to seek out women for reproduction. And so, yes, you are going to, your, your first default with women is going to be whether or not you want to have sex with them. But that is not, is not the totality of your thought process. You know, if you are, for example... Uh, someone like, I, for example, I truly think that Donald Trump does think the, the full extent to which Donald Trump thinks about women is whether or not he wants to have sex with them, which is why he's so, you know, erotically enamored with his own daughter, because uh, I don't think he can perceive how creepy and disgusting that is. But, uh, you know, if, if that's as far as you can think, if you're one of these cavemen types like he is, that that's as far as you can think and you can't uh, comprehend anything further than that, then yeah, that might be a problem. Then you might be a predator. Then you might be a uh, misogynist. Then you might be a sexist pig. Yes. But if you are a normal functioning human being, you have the ability to continue to think and continue to evaluate that person. So, uh, you know, okay, you think the first question is whether or not you want to have sex with that girl. Okay, now continue evaluating her character. Decide if decide uh, based on uh, actual well thought out logical criteria whether or not she's a, a worth decent worthwhile human being, and establish your opinion based on that. Just because you have this lizard brain automatic amygdala response does not mean 
that you are limited or required to only think that. By the same token, Robin, yeah, so a bunch of stereotypes enter your head. And you know what? When I'm out there in the world dealing with all different types of people, all different kind of stereotypes enter my head all day. But you know what, Robin? I don't freak the fuck out over it. I just... Uh, I don't freak the fuck out over it. I continue to evaluate the person on the basis of their individual merit. Because that's what's meant by individu individuality. You, have, you, you who have this cynical misinterpretation of individuality, that it's some kind of excuse that we make to cover up for uh, prejudiced thought or, or problematic thinking. No, it really is the key. Conti so you have a prejudiced, stereotypical thought into your brain about somebody. We'll continue getting to know that person as a person. Be continually... Uh, pulling out of them all of the traits and all the characteristics that are going to dispel and disprove that stereotype in your brain. And if you meet somebody that actually does embody that stereotype that you jumped to in the first place, that doesn't mean that you are having a problem with how you perceive the world. That person might well just happen to embody all of the traits of that stereotype. That it it's inevitable with 7.8 billion people on the planet that you're eventually going to uh, run into somebody that does. <sighs> the cat's in heat. She needs lots of attention. Anyway, the point being, that is what we are getting at here. That, that's the thing. Think. Don't be terrified of the first thought that enters your mind. Just because those thoughts enter your mind, those knee-jerk responses enter your mind, doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you. Think of it this way. A imagine a woman that's been raped. She's terrified of every man she looks at. Would you say that there's something, uh, would you say that she hates men or she just has this automatic ingrained response that she needs to, she needs help with? That's all it is. And uh, that's, that's what this is too. This is not indicative proof that there's something wrong with people or that people are bigoted. It means that they just have these automatic responses and then they continue to think. They continue to evaluate people. Okay, it, 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 absolutely, uh, it, it absolutely can be done. And we can accomplish this. The, as, as human beings, we can do this. We do it every day. So, again, no, this is not indicative of a problem. It is indicative of the far-left social justice radicals being scared of their own shadows because they don't understand how the brain works. These are the deeper feelings that I need to be willing to examine, for these feelings can and do seep out without my awareness and hurt those whom I love. As discussed in previous chapters, we live in a culture that circulates relentless messages of white superiority. These messages exist simultaneously with relentless messages of black inferiority. But anti-blackness goes deeper than the negative stereotypes all of us have absorbed, anti-blackness is foundational to our very identities as white people. Whiteness has always been predicated on blackness. As discussed in chapter 2, there was no concept of race or a white race before the need to justify the enslavement of Africans. Creating a separate and inferior black race simultaneously created the superior white race, one concept could not exist without the other. In this sense, Whites need black people, blackness is essential to the creation of white identity. Okay, that's bullshit for a couple of reasons. The first of them being that uh, the West African slaves that were shipped over to work as slaves were not the only group being used uh, for slave labor. The British were also sending over captives from the British Isles, and the Crown was sending over debt prisoners. So the idea that slavery in America was exclusively a concept, was a concept exclusive to blacks, is bunk. Therefore, the idea that creating white people were necessarily, or the concept of white people was necessarily codified around the idea of subjugating specifically black people is ridiculous. Now, some people will debate the idea that there were white slaves during the colonial slave era uh, by saying that those people were actually indentured servitude, uh, were actually indentured servants or something to that effect, uh, or were otherwise uh, not subjected to, say, to chattel slavery, the chattel slave trade in the United States. To that, I would say that uh, you are 
making an extraordinarily weak argument because ask any person that has had their uh, their freedom taken away from them and been forced to do manual labor against their will whether or not they think they're a slave and I think the answer is going to or how they feel about that rather and I think the answer would be much much different you know oh don't worry we don't categorize you that way so your situation is not as bad no it doesn't hold a lot of water the other thing is, and this is something that has been, people, it's funny, like, the the ongoing, the, the left somehow wants to, and by the way, I feel like I should address this now, whenever you bring up something like that, there's always about the, the, um, uh, the different white groups that were, uh, or ethnic European groups that were used as slaves in the United States as well, people try, people assume that you're trying to say that slavery wasn't that bad. No! I'm trying to say that it was much worse than you uh, than you ever imagined that it was. That it was far more widespread. That it was far more per uh, pervasive. Now, granted, blacks made uh, West African blacks made up the overwhelming majority of the people used in uh, used as slaves in the early uh, in the United States and in uh, the colonies and then the early days of the United States. Uh, yes, that is very true. But. Uh, they also, again, they also used uh, people from the British Isles. They also used um, Native Americans and other groups. So it's not, it, it, the idea that it was expressly created to establish a line in the sand between white and black is historically erroneous. The other thing is, and I, it's weird, it's like this is one of those arguments that just gets ignored altogether. They just won't talk about it, you know. And uh, that is the argument, or the point, the very true point. That's, and this is, again, this is not negating the severity of what happened in the United States at all. It's just a reality that needs to be discussed and acknowledged. Every culture throughout history has practiced slavery at some point. Period. And I don't know why that is such that I don't know why that is such a verboten thing to acknowledge. I mean, again, the West African slavers that were uh, the, the the slave trade to the United States began with West African slavers taking their own people as slaves, and, and then uh, you know the the term uh, the term slave originates from Slav for the Slavic people that were taken as slaves by the Moors, and so on and so forth. Slavery has been practiced throughout human history. The United States did the radical thing of fighting an internal war within its own splintering, uh, with uh, factions of its own splintering self, to end slavery, became, and became the worldwide gold standard for ending, the, for ending slavery, ushered in a new era where slavery was seen as the vile, inhumane, un, um, unacceptable practice that it is. But the very idea, that, that this, this idea that she's trying to build, this idea that slavery somehow began with white people enslaving blacks in the United States, specifically uh, that, that that was somehow, that, that it's not, it is an, a dark, Sad, tragic, and unfortunate, and uh, and um, I think in many ways unforgivable time in our history. But in the grand scheme of the human race, it is not a unique time in history at all. It was just business as usual for the uh, for the human race. What makes it different is that we fought that civil war to end it. That is what is revolutionary. That is what is special about it. Scholars have argued that whites split off from themselves and project onto black people the aspects that we don't want to own in ourselves. One for example, the white masters of enslaved Africans consistently depicted the Africans as lazy and childlike, even as they toiled at back-breaking work from sun up to sun down. Today, we depict blacks as dangerous, a portrayal that perverts the true direction of violence between whites and blacks since the founding of this country. Okay, so this needs to come out very carefully. I am not in any way, shape, or form going to try to... Uh, give any credence to the notion that blacks are inherently violent or anything like that. 
That is not what I am implying here at all. That is not what I'm suggesting. However, what she need, one thing she needs to uh, be corrected on is the idea that uh, violence only goes in one di- has only gone in one direction in this country. Violence has gone in every direction in this country at different times, and indeed, the majority of the violence occurs within the races. The majority of racial, the majority of violence between people occurs, uh, as statistics have shown, occurs between people of the same race, and 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 I think I mean I think that's a reasonable assertion given that uh, you know if if you uh, if you follow the logic then that uh, people if people are going to go to ethnically homogenous communities then the majority of conflicts that ar- will arise, their, their conflicts will arise within those communities, so the larger potentials of violence occur um, uh, internally, if you will. Uh, and again, you know, we, we know that the subject of black-on-black crime is something that nobody, absolutely nobody on the left or the right uh, ever wants to try to deconstruct, but that, that is what the real numbers show and the real inf- statistical information shows is that the most violence occurs within races, not across the board. And confusing stew of resentment and benevolence, for we also use blacks to feel warm-hearted and noble. We are drawn to those who cast their eyes downward in our presence, the ones we can save from the horrors of their black lives with our abundance and kindness. Consider an example I often use in my presentations, The Blind Side, a hugely popular movie for which Sandra Bullock received an Academy Award. So this is actually interesting because I was in The Blind Side. Uh, I was an extra in a couple of scenes. You, ca- I don't think you can see me. You, you definitely can't see me in the uh, crowd scenes. I'm also in the scene. There's there's a scene at the end. It's supposed to be at the in the Grove at Ole Miss, which I don't know why they didn't just go to Ole Miss. I guess because it's easier to there's there's you know tax breaks and whatnot here in Georgia. But um, they recreated the Grove, and I'm in that scene at the end where uh, the SJ character runs out and like jumps up the end and everything. I don't think you can see me there. Then I'm also in the the audience in all the football scenes, which you definitely can't see me there. All of the football scenes were filmed over the course of one week at one location. It was a private school here in Georgia. And uh, they would, just to change the the teams or whatever, they would redress the backstop and everything and then give us different uh, flags, different colored flags to wave and everything. Funny thing, uh, all of the crowd noise you hear, it's actually totally silent. Like, we're literally doing like that. Uh, when we're cheering, because all of the crowd noise is then added in later, so it's a very interesting, very surreal uh, experience to see all you know hundreds and hundreds of people pantomiming, screaming and cheering silently. Uh, but all of all the football scenes were shot in one week, and uh, so I'm I'm in all of them, but you can't really see me. And after a while, I got so bored. I remember I, this is I was reading. Um, World War Z by Max Brooks was the book I was reading, and I remember because I brought that book with me to read uh, in the downtime, and eventually I got so, I, I realized, like, it, it so does not matter if one person is in this infinite sea is not participating, so I just ended up sitting there on the bleachers way off in the distance and reading from my book the whole time, and um, the, I, I, it's funny, I remember there was, look, I remember looking down at the cheerleaders See, this is how little I don't I don't know anything about football. I didn't know anything about the the blind side, the the, the true story behind it or anything. Or aside from Sandra Bullock and Tim McGraw, I didn't know any of the actors that were involved. I did get to sit uh, in one scene. I was sitting about maybe twenty feet away from Sandra Bullock, so that was cool. But um, anyway, I remember looking at the cheerleaders. Um, the, uh, the the cheerleaders down there, and there was this one cheerleader that was uh, absolutely just stunningly gorgeous. I thought, man, she is cute. I'm going to go, like, during the break, I'm going to go see if I can introduce myself, strike up a conversation and everything. But it turns out that was, um, what's her name, Lily Collins, who was the the uh, playing the daughter of the uh, the family, the Tui family. So, of course, she was not in the uh, the actual, uh, she was not in the, the backstage uh, like the extras tent or anything. I didn't know that at the time. What was interesting, by the way, and I'm, I'll get back into the, the actual video, but what was interesting was when they filmed all of the, um, to give you an idea, like all of that shit was, most of that shit would be like, it'd be like 20 minutes between takes, and so it took hours and hours and hours of the same thing. Those cheerleaders, when they filmed the cheerleaders, between takes, 
right outside the range of the camera shot were a row of sleeping bags, and those girls would go over and get in the sleeping bags and go to sleep between takes because it was just grueling all night, all night long shoots. Man, I mean, it was it was endurance. It was good money too. I think I made like seven hundred dollars that week or something. Um, but it, and that, that was also the that was also the one where I I got so sick of the food at the extras tent that one time I just slipped in line with like the guys who were the football players uh, playing the football players on the field and um, they uh, the 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 extras that were doing that part of it. And I'm really tall anyway, so. Uh, I just slipped in line with those guys where they were eating with the main actors and everything. I ate like the gourmet food one night, and they real—I I don't know if I had an effect on that, but the next day they like—they uh, didn't just tell us to go to the mess tent. They like specifically escorted us there and watched us the whole time. So I, I, maybe I had some kind of effect on that. I don't know, but anyway, uh, that was kind of a fun, uh, just a fun excursion. Um, that I had with uh, with all of that. Oh, and also, there's another scene. Again, I don't think you can see me, um, but there's another scene that's supposed to be at Ole Miss, but it's um, it was actually filmed at Agnes Scott College here in town, or, or in the Decatur area, I should say. But um, it it goes by uh, like there's students going by in the background, and I'm one of the students. Again, I don't think you can actually pick me out though. Anyway, that's a long aside to say, yes, this is a topic that I actually know something about uh, to a certain degree. The other thing that I notice, or the other thing I want to point out, though, is the contradiction that Robin D'Angelo brings up here, where, you know, she, throughout this whole book, this whole book, <clears throat> she has been making the case that this, uh, that uh, white people have to use... I uh, have a moral obligation to use their advantage, advantages, and use their privilege, and use everything in their uh, every tool in their disposal as white people to elevate blacks because that's the, that they have a moral obligation to do that. And now she's going to just do an about face on that and complain because, uh, as she's described, she's just described it here because these these uh, that it, that it's somehow there's something. Uh, white people trying to help black people is now a uh, is now also a pathology of whiteness that is unacceptable. Even though throughout the whole book she has been advocating for exactly that. This film is a cogent example of whites as the racially benevolent side of the coin. The film is based on the true story of a family that you are his who rescued Michael Oha. Okay, so it probably wasn't clear what was uh, said there. The family name is the Tuies. And the young man's name is Michael Orr. And to quickly summarize, what happened was this wealthy uh, family, the Tuies, uh, met this young man, Michael Orr. This is a true story. Met this young man, Michael Orr, who uh, was a very, very exceptionally large uh, black uh, young adult who did not was living in abject poverty, did not have a lot of options in front of him, and was adopted by the family and subsequently sent to Ole Miss uh, to play football and then became a professional football player. And the thing is, what's interesting is she tries to portray this fundamentally as a propaganda piece when it is documenting something that actually happened. This actually did occur. A wealthy white family actually did adopt this young man and put him on the track to becoming a professional athlete. That actually did occur. So it's weird that she tries to talk about it as if it's some kind of stilted, uh, fiction, uh, fictionalized portrayal of some sort of uh, idealistic relationship between blacks and whites. No, it really did occur. Um, and uh, the, now, the other thing to point out, I know that Michael, Moore, uh, Michael Orr, excuse me, Michael Orr has gone on the record as um, uh, has has gone on the record saying that he is not happy with the film and how it portrayed him and uh, his relationship to the family and all of that. Uh, that is not that that is worthy of note. He does have his own problems with the film, and that is a reasonable uh, that is a reasonable concern for him to raise since it's about him. But um, it's it's not. It's certainly the the issue raised is certainly not that he regrets being rescued from abject poverty by a wealthy white family that decided to do something right, you know, do right by him. Uh, anyway, oh, one other thing, I, I, I'm sure I'll think of more of these as I go, but one interesting anecdote, uh, I never met 
the, I never met the actor playing Michael Orr, but I did encounter his stunt double. Uh, I was going into the restroom at one point between takes, and that guy was coming out, and I swear that dude was like seven and a half feet tall. I mean, I literally had to do like this to see. I, and I just walked up to him and said, I just want to shake your hand because I never meet anyone taller than me, and he just kind of chuckled and went on. So I thought that was neat. Black man who came from impoverished family circumstances and who went on to become an NFL player. Although the movie was popular with white audiences, many problematic racial narratives are re-inscribed in the film. In fact, there are no black characters who do not reinforce negative racial stereotypes. Ocha himself is portrayed as a childlike gentle giant who lives in abject poverty. Sprinkled in are his drug-addicted single mother with multiple children from unknown fathers, the incompetent welfare worker, the uppity lawyer, and the menacing gang members in his drug-infested and crime-ridden neighborhood. In so this is where it gets into an interesting dilemma. I cannot speak to the accuracy of the movie uh, in its de in the details because I um, uh, because obviously I don't know the situation personally. I don't know Michael Orr's actual story. I am sure that there was some. Um, I am sure that there was some uh, sympathetic or um, you know benevolent or sympathetic black person that they could have brought in, uh, some character in his life that they could have brought in if they had really thought about it. Uh, I'm sure that person exists in reality. But here's the thing. Take away, if you take away the, stop and think about what's actually happening here. If you take away the racial component of this story, there would not be any um, th there would not be any issue with uh, the quality of people that are being presented. And what I mean by that is, imagine if it's all about white people. It, the the whole thing is entirely white. Michael Orr is white. The 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 Tuies are white. Obviously, Michael Orr is white, and all of his family and gang members, everything he's everybody he's surrounded by. They're all white. At that point, uh, there would not be any, at, at that point, there would not be anything for Robin D'Angelo to glom onto. For example, uh, you would not have any, we would, we would be able to acknowledge the, the actual moral reality of the situation. That uh, Michael Orr's mother now, she of course, with the success of the movie, has been able to pull her life around. And she, I acknowledge again that I know she disputes part of it, parts of it. But speaking in and of the situation itself, the drug addicted single mother that has seven children by seven unknown fathers, if she had been white, we would have no trouble calling that out as a bad situation. Uh, we would have no trouble calling her out as a moral degenerate whatsoever. What Robin D'Angelo does is she ta uh, she takes it from being a story about poverty and forces the issue, poverty versus wealth and affluence, she takes it from that and forces the issue of race. Now again, I have to emphasize, this is based on a true story. If they're going to tell the true story that happened, they can't decide to portray Michael Orr as white. He, they have to, they, these are the ethnicities of the people that they're recreating. So, what she's doing here is taking a movie that is about, the movie is about poverty. At no point in the movie does it say, does it make an express, over, an overt expression of white good, black bad, or anything like that. It is a story about one person rising out of poverty. And that, you know, that's the central thing. There's a, a, uh, a break, that, there is a point in the movie, and this is kind of a spoiler, but the movie's still worth watching, obviously. Um, there's a point in the movie where uh, Michael Orr is being interviewed for um, a... He's being interviewed for a, an Ole Miss scholarship, and the person doing the interview... Uh, scholarship to uh, play at Ole Miss, to play football for Ole Miss, and the person doing the interviewing says, okay, here's what we're concerned about. The Tuies are alumni of Ole Miss. They see... They attend... Uh, Ole Miss football games regularly. They have season passes every year. You know, season passes purchased for the next decade or whatever. 
they are fans of Ole Miss. What we're afraid of is wealthy, affluent family, wealthy, affluent uh, families adopting athletes and pushing them through the system, or pushing them into Ole Miss to to create legacies for themselves, to uh, to in, you know inf- unfairly influence the team and that kind of thing. And at that point, Michael Orr has this. Uh, he has a sudden realization of, oh my God, what if the, you know, what if that's all this family was doing for me, and all of the love and support they've given me was all just a charade, you know, that they really just wanted me to go to Ole Miss and be their legacy, you know, their 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 legacy player that they contributed to the team and everything. And they have a he has a big falling out with the uh, Mrs. Tui, the Sandra Bullock character. I can't think of first names right now. Uh, Mrs. Tui, the Sandra Bullock character, and. <clears throat> She, um, they finally have <clears throat> this uh, reconciliation where they sit down and she says, I will support you in whatever, whatever in, you know, whatever team you want to play for, that's totally fine. You, you don't have to play for Ole Miss if you don't want to. Uh, I will support you for any team, any team you get uh, drafted to, I will support that team. And he says, what if I want to flip burgers? And she says, it's your life. You have to decide what you want to do with it. And the point being that this is a movie about being lifted out of poverty. It is not a movie that is seeking to demonize uh, black, uh, black people. They could, not, they could not portray, based on this true story, they could not have portrayed... Michael Orr's situation any other way. It's as if Robin DiAngelo. It's it's as if Robin DiAngelo thinks that uh, portraying the existence of a black uh, impoverished class within the United States in media is some sort of abject fiction. That that reality in and of itself. Is not something is 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 that that's some kind of unreality that that's so totally prop, uh, propagandized, and uh, I mean I can tell you it's not. If you're in Atlanta, go down to um, take I uh, exit uh, take I seventy five eighty eighty five south to exit two forty four, get off on University Avenue and drive around for a while. Those the situation that Michael Lore was living in exists. It's real. It's there. Conversely, the uh, the situation, as I've mentioned before, what I should also point out, what is also uh, prevalent in Atlanta is a tremendous amount of black prosperity. And in that case, you know, you can, um, there's a tremendous, I know there's a tremendous amount of, um, uh, I, I, I want to say black affluence or, or black community affluence, uh, south of the airport, there's a whole hub of it down there, and then also up north of uh, up north of Atlanta, in the what's normally thought of as the hoity-toity uh, district, in you know East Cobb and Roswell and all that. I'm in that the the Marietta area right now. I'm not living in in uh, you know I'm not living in affluence, obviously, but it's all around. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is it's like she thinks that black poverty is some sort of complete fiction that we've made up while at the same time refusing to acknowledge that there's blacks that are doing better than poverty it's like she it's almost like it's almost like she thinks of black people entirely in the hypothetical and that any attempt to discuss uh, the black situation in the concrete is a manifestation of bigotry not an attempt to identify problems and move towards solutions. One pivotal scene, Ocha returns to his former neighborhood. As he walks down the street, he is surrounded by a gang that tries to intimidate him while he considers his limited options. Mrs. Chu Oe arrives and confronts the gang members, who quickly back down and retreat. Rescued by Mrs. Chu Oe, Ocha is returned back to safe white suburbia. The scene makes it clear, the only way Ocha could be saved from the terrors of his own black community is through the benevolence and bravery of a white family. Again, that was the situation that Michael Orr was actually in. This is not a, a this is not a fiction drawn out of a desire to propagandize a particular point of view. 
that was very much the re now don't get me wrong it's not a perfect portrayal of reality as we'll get into but that was the overarching nature of the reality that he was in and again as i come back to it the idea she has gone on and on through this book that white people have to use their affluence and their uh, social status and their uh their wealth and their ability and all of that to help uh blacks she keeps grinding that home over and over and over again and then when they actually do that's also a problem. This book has no consistent message. It's just whatever you think is wrong. That's all it is. She's, it's like she's literally just come up with a compendium of arguments, uh, arguments about, uh, against racism and gone through each one and said, oh, actually, you're guilty of that too, and if you don't, if you don't admit to being guilty of it, then you are uh, proving that you're guilty of it. That's all she's doing. In the film, white professionals discuss Ocha as if he were developmentally disabled. He certainly comes off as such. He is passive and inarticulate throughout the movie. His teachers note that on his IQ test, he scored in the bottom percentile in ability to learn but in the top percentile in protective instinct. As a professor of education who has never heard of a test measuring protective instinct, I have been unable to find evidence of this bizarre measurement. It is highly problematic that Ocha, as a black male, is portrayed as severely lacking in intellectual abilities but exceptional in something instinctual. His limited intellectual capacity is reinforced throughout the film. For example, when the youngest child of the Chuoi household has to teach Ocha how to play football. According to the film, Ocha is never able to understand the rules of the game. So Mrs. Chuo appeals to his protective instinct by telling him to pretend one of his new white family members is going to be hurt. Once his instincts are engaged, rather than his intellect, he is unstoppable on the field. In a particularly insulting scene, the white child who tried unsuccessfully to teach Ocha how to play football sits at a table negotiating a contract for him with powerful adult men while Ocha sits in the background, mute. Okay, so what she's not telling you there, the critical piece of information she's leaving out, is that in that scene, and it happens it actually, it's, it's actually several scenes, the character SJ, the little boy, is negotiating the contracts because uh, the um, early on in the negotiations, one of the um, uh, scouts uh, turns to SJ and says, "You know, and what are you, something like what are you hoping to get out of this?" And a kind of light bulb goes off that he can try to get as much uh, swag and as much attention and as much um, you know, a, a just kid wish fulfillment stuff as he possibly can out of these negotiations. And that's why he's sitting there doing the contracts because he's trying. To, it's it's just a comedic thing. He's trying to portray it. He's trying to get as much money or as much um, as much out of it for himself as he possibly can. It's just a comedic through line throughout the movie. That's why everyone is sitting there mute, including. The Michael or uh, Michael or as he's portrayed in the movie they're all sitting there mute because they're all like who is this kid the, you know this this precocious kid that's just dominating the discussion that's all it is and she's complete it's like I mean it comes down to having a hammer and seeing every problem as a nail she inter she's determined to interpret everything in this movie as a racial smack in the face to Michael or and so that's how she perceives it um, I tried to do some research to find a, um, a test that measures um, protective instinct, and I found a few things that were referenced in like Reddits and chat discussions. I couldn't, uh, but I couldn't find any confirmation of those things either. Um, what's interesting to me is that apparently it never occurred to Robin D'Angelo to, you know, actually do some research here, maybe uh, get in touch with. The, uh, the author of the original book, that it maybe read the book that it's actually based on, uh, find, try to find out what happens, because part of what happens here is certain composite uh, choices are made. And by composite choices, a whole in, in narrating, one of the things that happens in narrating a true story is you have to make certain composite decisions that are going to bring together a long, what's actually a long series of discussions or a long series of events, or a group of characters. Uh, for a great example, if you watch the movie Private Parts, um, which is the biopic about Howard Stern, uh, Howard Stern is uh, tormented throughout the movie by one boss that he refers to as Pig Vomit. Well, Pig Vomit was actually several different people in the original memoir. It's just a composite character that represents all of these people 
that were going after you know that were trying to get Howard Stern to get his um, his show you know tame and everything and all of that. So by the same extension, this thing about a protective instinct thing, I would if I had to guess, it's probably something where there were like you know twenty different tests that he took, and there were a bunch of different uh, there there were a bunch of different pieces of information that they. Uh, you know, brought together to make an argument about, oh, well, he's, he would probably be good at this, that, or the other. I would think it's probably something like that, and they're just doing a composite and saying, oh, he scored off the chart on protectiveness, you know, that kind of thing. Um, that's my guess. And again, I thought about really digging into it to try to get at the truth of it, but at the end of the day, uh, it is on Robin D'Angelo to prove her points, and she simply does not. She continues to make assumptions, and she continues to, re to do, she continues to refuse to do even the slightest modicum of research. Probably because I, you know, I'm, I'm just going to throw it out there. Probably because she knows if she did, she might be wrong. I don't know, but that's how it seems. This film, told from the white perspective and enthusiastically received by audiences, reinforces some very important dominant ideologies. White people are the saviors of black people. Some black children may be innocent, but black adults are morally and criminally corrupt. You know, here's the thing. One of the things we've got to realize, uh, first of all, the idea that black children are innocent but black adults are corrupt is, to my knowledge, not a stereotype about that I have ever heard about the black community anywhere. I think that is wholly and completely made up for this. But one thing that I really think bears repeating here is we have so, we have all so adopted the language and the perspective of uh, critical theory to such a degree that we don't stop to think that it's optional. It's optional to view the world and view media through a, a, a lens of critical theory. I think most people don't watch a movie like The Blind Side with a scorecard uh, trying to determine uh, who are the good guys, you know, which ethnicity embodies the good guys and which ethnicity embodies the bad guys or who's represented which ways and how. We don't, people don't watch it that way. And here's the thing. It has so, being involved in this discussion, the critical theory evalu way of evaluating things has so entered my thought process that, you know, I remember a couple of years ago when um, Shape of Water was the top, uh, you know, the, the, the Oscar winner and all of that, and everybody was seeing it, everybody was recommending it, and I went and I watched it, and I saw it, and I thought, okay, so I, I watched it, and I immediately realized every white person, you know, every villain in this movie is a white male. Every villain is a white male. All of the good guys, if they're white, they're female, or if they're male, they are of other ethnicities, with two exceptions, and both of the benevolent white males are either, uh, one is overtly and one is implied to be homosexual. Uh, so they could, you know, the idea, it, it comes down to straight white male bad. Go watch, you know, you look at that movie, it's a beautifully done movie, I love Gilbert or I can't say it, Guillermo del Tormo, you know who I'm talking about, I can't talk tonight. Um, I love his work, I love his, his movies, Pan's Labyrinth is phenomenal, I highly recommend it, but it was so obvious to me that, uh, you know, the, the layout, and then you have the uh, disgustingly feminist um, uh, creature, the alien creature thing, it's never described, it's never confirmed what it is, but this, this E.T. thing, it is a, it's, it's this, this uh, submissive male sex partner for this woman, and, the, uh, and, and I love that it has a genitalia that only presents when the woman desires to see it. You know, it, it's like it's the most neutered, politically correct, asinine, politically correct movie I think I, you know, I have ever seen, and it was just blew me away. And I've told people that, and you know, they think about it, and they realize that I'm correct, but they think, but then they're like, wow, I never thought of it like that. I never watched it that way. And that's the thing. Most people aren't watching movies this way. They aren't watching movies to evaluate them on, uh, on this weird power structure 
of who, who gets the most talking points or who gets the most screen time and who's saying what to who. They're just watching the story. Whites who are willing to save or otherwise help black people, at seemingly great personal cost, are noble, courageous, and morally superior to other whites. Individual black people can overcome their circumstances, but usually only with the help of white people. Black neighborhoods are inherently dangerous and criminal. That is not a statement that is made in the movie. They are portraying the environment that Michael Orr came out of. Virtually all blacks are poor, incompetent, and unqualified for their jobs. They belong to gangs, are addicted to drugs, and are bad parents. The most dependable route for black males to escape the inner city is through sports. White people are willing to deal with individual deserving black people, but whites do not become a part of the black community in any meaningful way, beyond charity work. 11. Of course, Ocher also brings redemption to the whites who save him. The film ends with a voice negation over from Mrs. Chuoe, a Christian, claiming it was God's will that this boy be saved, presumably because his talent on the field made him more profitable and thus valuable to white people. The Chuoh is, of course, are the good whites who have to deal with the prejudice of the individual bad whites they encounter at the country club and other places. In this way, the racist equals bad, not racist equals good binary is also reinforced. Jesus Christ, Robin, the world is not operating off of your criteria. No, it is not reinforcing this thing you call the racist equals bad, not racist equals good binary. Also, by the way, <laughs> Robin, by portraying the Tuies as morally separate from the bad whites, they are acknowledging degrees, uh, they, they are, why am I putting this in such articulate terms? They are not portraying white people as inherently the saviors of blacks. They're portraying the Tuies as the exception to the norm. God. The film is fundamentally and insidiously anti-black. White racial socialization engenders many conflicting feelings toward African Americans. Benevolence, resentment, superiority, hatred, and guilt royal barely below the surface and erupt at the slightest breach, yet can never be explicitly acknowledged. Our need to deny the bewildering manifestations of anti-blackness that reside so close to the surface makes us irrational, and that irrationality is at the heart of white fragility and the pain it causes people of color. Okay. Let's stop for a minute. And we don't need to hear I, we don't need to hear anything else Robin D'Angelo has to say about the blind side because it is uh, it, it's just going to be more tripe. But let's stop for a minute. My, the, the movie does portray an African American that falls outside of those negative stereotypes. Michael Orr. Now again, Michael Orr is, has gone on the record saying he's not happy with the way he's portrayed in the movie. One, one thing I know, uh, one example I read is that he, uh, uh, you know, he, he says, you know, he was not a despondent person like he was, like he's portrayed in the movies. He was not despondent, he's a very bright, cheerful person, that sort of thing. But, fundamentally, yes, it's, it's amazing. She will not acknowledge Michael Orr as a person. She cannot see in the Michael Orr character, just as he's portrayed in the movie, we'll, we'll talk about him the, the the historical inaccuracies aside, let's talk just about how he's portrayed in the movie. She looks at that character, and she can only see negativity. She can only see negativity in that character, that he's childlike, that he speaks, that he's soft-spoken and, uh, you know, somewhat inarticulate. Uh, these are the things that she focuses on. She doesn't see the wonderful character that that is portrayed in that movie, someone who is compassionate, who is uh, looking for, who, 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 unlike those around him, has a, a remarkably deeper and more mature awareness of what love and family and compassion and human connection ought to be. Someone who, who 
someone who is deeply conflicted with the knowledge that he wants to be more than the world than, than the world around him that he does want to step out he does want to escape from that world but he doesn't know how that he is the black he is the black character that she accuses the movie of not having robin d'angelo is not capable of seeing michael orr as a quality person because robin d'angelo is only capable i believe only capable of perceiving blacks in a negative light her prejudices are what are keeping her from recognizing michael orr as morally superior michael orr begins the story as being morally superior to those other characters around him that's the point that he is surrounded by those things and he is in danger of being absorbed by them what they see what they say they don't the, at first, the, the way it starts, all they see is a kid walking by himself on the side of the road and it, in the rain, and they decide to try to help him. They don't know anything about him. They don't have any aspirations of turning him into a pro football player. They just want to help him. And they perceive in him, they per, what, what they perceive in him is what sets him apart from the racial stereotypes that surround him. Just like, well, uh, just like their compassion and their benevolence is what sets them apart from the white stereotypes that surrounds them, that surround them, the Tuies. The, you know, if the movie has one commentary on race to make, it is that when we can see beyond, when we can find the people, we find the people who have not been absorbed by the stereotypes. That is what shatters the stereotypes. The people that we ought to exalt and we ought to elevate are the people who don't fit into those molds, who don't fit into those stereotypes. And that that is important. That is how progress is made. That is what the movie is trying to say, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't communicate when you're watching it with a scorecard. Anyway, I'm getting tired. I need to go to bed. Um, I... Uh, as of this video, so I, I made all of these clips a couple uh, a couple weeks ago. I've got a few more from that collecting of clips that I need to get to. And then where I'm at now, I still have the last 30 minutes of the audiobook to go through and pull points from that I want to comment on. I only made 10 of those title cards. I hope that's enough. <laughs>